G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. With the gear train positioned within the mechanism, the support structure can now be fabricated. And you can see that it consists of some rather awkward shapes that will require careful work to form. Each support assembly has three critical features. An arc struck from the centre of the device, another struck from the bearing position, and a bearing hole for the wheel assembly pivot. So to help form the two arcs, I've turned up a custom superglue arbour as well as some simple alignment jigs. The arbour is large enough to accommodate the parts at the same scale as they would be if located in the bowl of the mechanism. And the annulus and alignment discs will be used to recreate the geometry of the part relative to its bearing position. So starting with bar stock, I cut out the raw sections and fixed on paper templates. And it's worth mentioning that I'm using the templates a little differently to normal. Rather than using them for an exact reference, in this case I'm using them just as a rough placement guide. I've marked the inside diameter of the bowl on the face of the arbour in permanent blue marker, and the template helps me make sure that the arc will fall safely within the body of the raw stock. It's also worth mentioning that I bonded the parts in diagonally opposed pairs. To some extent this helped to balance the work during the cut, but it also permits convenient measurement of the outside diameter using standard calipers across the two parts. OK, so with the raw stock in position, the outside arc for all four parts was then formed on the lathe. Each of the parts now has an outside arc that matches the inside diameter of the mechanism's bowl, and this now becomes the reference surface for forming the clearance arc. The geometry associated with each support can be recreated on the face of the arbour, using first the correct alignment disc to position the annulus, and then using the inside diameter of the annulus to register the part. It's fairly straightforward to align the part by eye for this second cut, bearing in mind that the arc will be more accurately marked out with dividers later. But one way to ensure that the part falls within the boundary of the raw stock is to simply leave an excess of margin material at the sides of the part. A small alignment error then becomes of no consequence, causing nothing more troubling than a shift of the part a little to one side of the raw stock. Once bonded into place, each of the risers was faced to the correct height and the clearance arc was marked out and formed. OK, so at this point the two arcs have been formed in each of the parts, and the next step is to accurately locate each part within the bowl. And although the support risers will be permanently bonded into place in a later episode, for now it's a great convenience to be able to repeatedly remove them. Which means once I've located each part inside the bowl, I need to use a register pin to record that position. Once located, the risers were temporarily glued in place, and the positions for the pins marked out, taking care to confirm that the pins would comfortably fall within the perimeter of the final part. The parts were then released from the bowl using acetone, and the pins installed.
Okay, so that's the risers complete for the moment. Next up are the removable support plates. Again, paper templates can be used to roughly size the stock. And I've left on the same generous margin to allow for any alignment error within the underlying support riser. The outside radius of each of the plates was then reduced to be a close match with the outside curve of each of the risers. Each support plate was then pushed firmly into register with the inside diameter of the bowl and then temporarily bonded to its riser. The centres of rotation for the support assemblies were re-identified and the bearing holes opened up in each of the support plates. The circular section around the bearing hole can be accurately defined with a filing button and whilst the radial lines can be geometrically constructed, I think it's probably easier to just use the paper templates. This aspect of the part is not critical and a reasonable amount of error either side won't make much difference, so you could even construct the lines by eye if you wish. But it's fairly straightforward to position the templates well using the hole and the outside arc. And a bonus of using the templates is that it also provides the hole positions for the fasteners and the steady pins. I used a scriber to trace over the template marking, lightly cutting through the paper to the underlying metal and so marking out the radial line position. Again a soak in acetone dissolves the bond and the small burr raised by drilling and tapping can be knocked down with 800 grit abrasive paper. The register pins were then installed into each of the plates. A temporary fastener works well to hold the parts together as the excess stock is removed and the perimeter of the workpiece was then taken to the line.
the pins having been peened close to the surface were then blended into the surrounding material. The other ends of the bowl register pins were also blended with the surrounding metal and the whole surface was given an 800 grit brushed finish in preparation for etching. And that brings us to the final parts for this stage of the build, the four custom fasteners for the support plates. So with the wheel assemblies again lightly tacked together, it's time for that all important test fit. The support structure has made a noticeable improvement on the feel of the wheelwork. In particular, the lunar phase display assembly is now well supported, and generally everything feels a lot more stable. Also, the device can now be inverted, which makes it much easier for the user to set the dials. And speaking of which, in the next episode I'll make a start on etching those dial markings. Thanks for watching, I'll see you later.